Are you kidding me? I could be back at Coastal on a weekend in this new room. Oh my goodness. If your guest name is David, I'm not the normal guy. The normal guy is right there. And TJ, what an honor to stand where you typically stand. I love your pastors. I know it's, it's I'm gonna give you a moment to tee you up really good in just a second. Just to hang with me. I know it's good manners when you're a guest speaker to say nice things about the church and nice things about the leaders. But this church is unique. I mean, to see a church taking the turf you are taking in South Florida, this ain't the Bible Belt, folks. To see what you guys are doing, building these buildings, watching this church grow explosively, meaningful ministry. But I've loved your leaders, man, since the time you guys kind of hit town. And so TJ, to stand where you typically stand, or Shayla. And listen, both of them need to be tested for PEDs. Not just because he's ripped. I mean, preaching and enhancing drugs, because they're both such great preachers and leaders. And uh, to watch the journey together, you guys, to cheer you on, Man, love you so much, my friend. You know that. Would you please stand to your feet right now, Coastal, and give it up for your pastors, TJ and Shayla McCormick. You knew better than that. Come on, come on. There you go. There you go. They're rare. You're blessed. You may be seated, may be seated. Find your Bibles. Find Joshua chapter 6. And so uh, I'm a neighborhood guy in all kinds of ways. Number one, it took me six and a half minutes to get here from my house. Thank you for that. But I pastor Church by the Glades right now down the road, and we're our sister churches. We're on the same team. Other churches are never the competition. We're family, amen, we're family. And so I pastor Church by the Glades, but I also now, because I get bored easily, I pastor First Baptist Church of Fort Lauderdale. And uh, you might know that massive building down on Briar Boulevard, that church kind of fell on hard times. But when I was a young guy in this area, I grew up in South Florida, it was the church. I mean, the large, powerful ministry, you know, watch it dwindle to a few hundred people. So we've stepped in at Glades to help resurrect that church. It's going great. We have poured a lot of volunteers and man hours and a lot of money. But the great thing is we're not alone. I've never seen this happen in my ministry like this. Other churches around South Florida and for other places, big church in Dallas, Pastor Stephen at Elevation have sent checks. Normally they promise to pray, but they never send money. <laughs> One of the largest checks came from Coastal. Coastal wrote a big check to First Baptist because we all feel like we cannot lose that pivotal si a church in the heart of the city. So it's fun to see what God is doing. You can see we renovated the main room. It's 3,000 people can sit in that room. So God's doing a great work, but we, are, we understand how vital this is. We serve together, we give together. And generosity, look, you guys are generous and look at God bless us. So you cannot outgive our great God. Anyways, glad you're here. Glad I'm here. I'm, I can't wait to do this. Find your Bibles. Find Joshua chapter six. And who's this going to help today? Hopefully everyone, but especially somebody. You're doing the stuff. I mean, you love God. You're a saved person. You're baptized, and, and you're not perfect. But you're in God's word. You're, you're here in worship on a, on a, on a holiday weekend. You're, you spend time in prayer. You're, you're trying to live a sufficiently sanctified life. Hey, you're doing all the stuff, but you're not seeing the progress. Not seeing the evident blessing other people describe. You hear their testimonies. You know, they're healing. They're resourcing. They got the client. They got the raise. They got the job. She made honor roll. He made varsity. And you're like, God, I'm not jealous. But when, when does it happen for me? I feel like I'm serving you without that payoff. I, I'm, I'm serving you without that blessing. God, I'm in. But when's that going to happen? The timing, the timing. So there's a famous, famous story tucked away in the Old Testament. It's about Joshua. Now, Joshua's famous. He's not like Mount Rushmore famous, like, you know, Moses or Abraham or King David or Elijah. He's like next tier down. But I love I loved Joshua integrity, guys, a warrior, a man of a radical, quick obedience. I love the example of the turf-taking leader, Joshua. But this story is a famous story. I mean, it's one of the big ones. Like, if you happen to grow up in Sunday school, vacation Bible school, even in a drive-by, you learn the story of Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. I mean, if you knew the Bible, it's like, it's like a biggie, like the story of Noah in the big boat, Jonah in the big fish, and David in the big bully, Goliath. This one's a great story. In fact, in honor of some of us who learned the story as a kid, I asked, I could read the whole 17 verses, but I thought more exciting, I asked some of the young theologians at Church by the Glades to read this passage. Please give your attention to the screens. Okay, Wolfie, you're gonna say what I say. Are you ready? Look at Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. But I don't like to say that word. Okay. Jericho was tightly shut up. Jericho was tight and shut up. 
because of the Israelites. No one came out and no one came in. Then the Lord says to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into my hands. Along the king and fighting me on. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the walls of the city will collapse and the people will go up every main straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the people in advance, March around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carried the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua had commanded the people to not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. So the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the people returned to camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priest took up the Ark of the Lord. Good job, buddy. You want to do it one more time? Yeah. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the Ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the Ark of the Lord, while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around when the priests sounded the trumpet's blast, Joshua commanded the people, Shout for the Lord has given you the city. When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so every man charged straight in, and they took the city. Joshua 6, 1 through 16, 20. Would you please say thank you to our young theologians who are nice enough to read that for us. So if you went to vacation Bible school or Sunday school, or maybe catechism class or Hebrew school, you may, maybe you heard the story, but if not, I'm a little jealous because sometimes if you grew up with a story like this, it wears off the fact this is fascinating, this is remarkable, this is a crazy miracle, it becomes a, a biblical cliche. So there's so much we could talk about this story, you know, seven days they march in circles, but I, I wanna do this, I wanna point out there's always, there's always a Jericho. There's always a barrier between you and your blessing. There's always some obstacle you navigate. There's always some pushback. There's always some negativity. There's always calls for discouragement. Do you think the devil's gonna just sit back and watch you waltz into the promised land? Unopposed. So every time, but I, I could talk about that, but I wanna talk about this. Why seven days? Why? Because God could do the whole thing in seven seconds. I wanna talk about why seven days or the bigger idea, timing. God's timing. When I say three, would you please shout the word timing? Ready? One, two, three. Anybody ever been, you know, fascinated, intrigued, but also confused, perplexed by God's timing? Anybody? Anybody? At God, you're moving too fast, or God, you're moving too slow. God's timing is a fascinating thing. The Bible says for our great God, you know, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like, like one day. So I want to talk for just a moment about a theology of God's timing. In fact, I want to ask an answer if I can. A great question the scholars have had for many years, deep theological question. What kind of car do you think God drives? What kind of car do you think God drives? I think God's probably a car guy because cool cars are cool cars. So uh, you might say, well, maybe God, um, God's powerful. He's mighty. Maybe God drives a, a monster truck. God has all kinds of holy horsepower, right? He's, he, he rolls over the enemies. Maybe he's all about power. I would say that that's, that's maybe, but I would think that doesn't fit Jesus. I mean, Jesus is powerful, but Jesus has style, I think Jesus would drive more like a 1966 Shelby Cobra. That, that, that's a cool car, amen? Do I have any car guys in the room? Any car guys in the room? Make some noise. Car guys, car girls. 
All right, that's a cool ride, but Jesus was cool. Jesus had style. Forget, you know, calming the storm and walking on the water. I like the way he dispenses enemies with a word when they try to entrap him and snare him. I mean, my Savior had swag, amen? Uh, you might go, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe David, God, if God has a car, he drives like an old school Ford Model T because God's old. God's old, been around a long time. He's a little out of touch, out of date, you know. His whole thing is a little antique, this idea of worshiping God, and I would say respectfully, I could not disagree more. Yes, God is the ancient of days. He, he precedes time, but my God is so relevant. My God would love to invade your 2024 right now kind of life with relevance and power right now. My God is not out of date. He's not old. Uh, how about this? Here's the car I think that God drives. I think after research and careful study, he drives a DeLorean, a 1981 time-traveling, Doc Brown modified, back to the future DeLorean because God has his ability to kind of travel through time. God bounces through time. God can inspire prophets like Zechariah and Isaiah and Jeremiah to say all these specific things about Messiah and then drive his glory into the first century and boom, nail every one of those prophecies in the life and ministry of Jesus. How can God do that? Because God, our God is so great. Our God is so strong. He's above time. He's not limited by finite physical categories like time and space. My God, that's why a thousand years is like one day. And one day, like a thousand, he drives a DeLorean. Turn to your neighbor and say, God drives a DeLorean. I didn't know that. God drives a time-traveling DeLorean. That's why his timing sometimes is perplexing. So how do I discover or discern God's perfect timing for my life? Great question. Best source? Scripture. Scripture. You always find God's will within the boundaries of God's word. And sometimes there's verses on when you should do something. Like, uh, like, oh gosh, salvation. If you're here today and don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you should do that today. In like 17 minutes, I'm gonna pray a prayer at the end of the talk, and you should pray along with me, and that remarkable prayer will change your everything. Why? We're gonna tap into a promise of God where it says, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So you should do it today. The moment I say today, you're like, mm, bump the brakes. Hey, uh, preacher guy, not even, I'm a, you're the guest guy, not the real guy. Really, I, I'm not ready. I'm doing research. I'm kicking tires. I'm not even close. Guess what? The Bible says you're ready. On the screen right now is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Look what it says. You read loudly, loudly, the highlighted word. I'll do the rest. Ready? It says, I tell you, now. one more time, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of you're more ready than you know. God's Holy Spirit says, you're ready. You're, I know you got questions. I know you have reservations. I know you feel unworthy. I know you have theology. Like, I don't know, David. Does Adam have a belly button? Who cares? <laughs> you're ready. God says, now is your time. Now is your time. You can take that step of faith today. So sometimes you get a verse. Other times you have to kind of read the lay of the land. God is a providential God. He, he works through our circumstance. You pray about something. There's not a verse, and, you know, a, a job or a relocation or something. You, you pray and God, uh, he'll, he'll kind of work through the circumstances. Let me show you. I use the language of, I'll stick with cars, the open road. Sometimes in life I pray for something and God gives me a stop sign. A stop sign. You might call it a closed door. And at first, I'm discouraged. I'm not praying for something stupid or selfish. But I'm praying, God, please make me the most successful crack dealer in South Florida. I'm not praying that. I'm praying for something, hopefully, you know, a good thing, a godly thing. And all of a sudden, boom, stop sign. And to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, complete this statement. A stop sign means we all got that right. We don't roll through it. We don't you know, slow it. Stop. Firm stop, look right and left, right? A stop sign means stop. And I used to get discouraged or frustrated when God would give me a stop sign, but I've learned the older I get, trust God. A stop sign is actually your friend. It's not, it's not negative, it's actually a great thing. It's God giving direction. It's God eliminating an option. It's God, I mean, how many times have you prayed for something or a single person, someone, right? You pray, God, it'd be so perfect. God, this, this would be amazing. This client, this opportunity, her or him, and and God gives you the stop sign. And it, it ain't six years later. It's like six weeks later. And you're like, oh, God, thank you so much for the stop sign because that would have been a dumpster fire in my life. That would have been terrible. I didn't know. I, that person, God, I didn't, know, I didn't know she was crazy, God. She's crazy or he's crazy. So I've just learned his direction. Other times God gives you 
the green light, the green light, the green light. Now, complete the, complete the statement. A green light means, no. one more time. A green light means, no. and that is correct, but incomplete. I just want to specify, if you're watching online, uh, our locations are here in South Florida. And South Florida is amazing. I love the climate. I love the culture. I love the cuisine. But the drivers down here, thank you. So I want to specify, just for the sake of my sanity and yours, a green light means go, but fully a green light means go now. Say it with me. A green light means go now. Loudly, a green light means go now. Because some of y'all don't go now. You're that red light, it transitions to green, and you're on your phone, checking your likes, right? You're in the rearview mirror, checking your teeth. Go now! In fact, if I can vent for a moment, can I, TJ, can I vent? I'm too, too cheap to pay for therapy. I just tell my church my issues. I mean, I live here in the neighborhood, right? You know, that turn signal, right? Uh, University in Westview. Six people can make it through that left-hand turn. And if I'm number six and you're number five in front of me, you might cause me to stumble on my faith. I mean, if, if you're there and that light transitions to green and the first driver recognizes the green light means go now. And the second driver recognizes the green light means go now. And three and four, they know it means go now, but you're number five. You're playing wordle with friends. You have placed me on the horns of a moral dilemma because of my unsaved flesh. I want to lay on that horn and go, wake up, dummy. I'm going to miss the light because you don't want pay. You're not paying. It means go now. But I can't do that. Because I have a Church by the Glade sticker on the back of my car. <laughs> so what do you do? What do you do? You give it like a little polite, like beep, beep, right? Beep, 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 beep. And finally, finally, you, you wake up, you go, oh, oh my gosh, the light, light. And you make it through it as it cycles from yellow to red. And I'm stuck through a whole other light change because you did not recognize, say it with me, a green light means go one more time, it means go what? Go. When God gives you a green light, it means go now. Sometimes life has limited windows of opportunity. If you hesitate, you miss your moment. I used to tell my kids when they were little punks, hey, slow obey is no obey. And sometimes, you can borrow that, you can borrow that. Sometimes if we hesitate, we miss out. We, we think there'll be a better time later and that better time never comes. You think you're not ready for salvation or baptism or to forgive someone or begin to be generous or serve. Go now, go now. Turn to your neighbor and whisper, whisper. Look at him, stand there. go now, tell him, go now, go now, go now. Don't delay the obey. And the other times God on his timing gives us a sign, one of those slow signs, those annoying slow signs like with construction. I think Joshua got a lot of slow signs. If you study his biblical biography, his story is spectacular. It is sensational. It's very successful, by the way. Oh, gosh. If you're into biblical success, check out Joshua chapter 1. It's remarkable how many times the word success shows up in that story. And by the way, I don't believe in prosperity or success. I'm that kind of preacher unless it's described verbatim in the Bible. But his story is a slow story. Seven days, seven days. It takes seven days. Seven, like, like nothing seemed to happen for six of the seven days. And most of the seventh day. And by the way, we meet Joshua 40 years before. In fact, we first meet Joshua back in Exodus chapter 17. Exodus, that's four books to the left. That's one book away from Genesis. Joshua's a success, but not an overnight success. And I find this, write this down. Success typically takes time. I know we live in this highly impatient world that we're fixated and fascinated by people who seem to succeed early and quickly and easily. It's not the way it normally goes down. In fact, let's imagine ourselves if we can. How about, I love to put myself in this story. I want to pretend like I'm a person who lived back in the day. I think it helps humanize and despiritualize Bible stories. Imagine you and I lived in Joshua chapter six. And we're, we're Hebrews, and we're not famous Hebrews or, or leaders of our clan. We're just two regular guys, right? You're, a, you're Hank the Hebrew. I'm... I'm Izzy the Israelite, right? We're from the tribe of Nephtali. It's not a famous tribe. But the cry to arms goes out, and we're, we're like, we're not soldiers, but we want to do the right thing, so we volunteer, and, and we go, and our wives and families are terrified that we might die in battle. It was brutal back in the day, right? But seven days late, we come back to our homes. We're covered in, in dust from the debris, of the, the walls falling down. And your wife runs out and throws her arms around you. She's so relieved to see you. And your kids come and hug your knees, and you're like, Baby, you won't believe what I saw. How God, how God worked. I, the walls just fell. 
And that night around the campfire with our neighbors, other men from Naphtali, we're just talking about, I feel like we're part of a miracle, a legit miracle, like, like with Moses and Pharaoh and the Red Sea and the plagues, we saw God move on our behalf and you were just amazed. It's surreal, it's powerful. And then that night in your bed, laying there again, that dumb smile on your face, you've now had your shower and you're drifting off to sleep in that kind of half awake, half asleep place and you start to think, but why did it take seven days? I don't get the seven days. For the six days, nothing seemed to happen. For six days, we weren't training for six days. We weren't building siege equipment for six days. We weren't forging weapons for six days. That would make sense. We just marched around in circles while nothing happened. The walls were just as big. The gates were so barred. The enemy soldiers as defiant. Why? You might even ask God, God, why, 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 why? You can ask God your why questions. Hear this. God is never offended by a good, honest why question. You say, God, why? I don't get God, thank you for the extra cardio and the steps I logged on my Fitbit, but why? Why the first six days? Because nothing seemed to happen. You could ask God what, he may not tell you why. You could ask him why. It's, it's a fair question because sometimes success takes time. I love the verbs in stories, like all kinds of verbs, verbs. When I say three, shout the word verbs. One, two, three, verbs. verbs. That was terrible shouting. One, two, three. Verbs, there you go, church. Verbs, the action words, right? Uh, what are they doing? Uh, let's see, they're, uh, they're tooting horns, they're tooting horns, they're shouting in unity, uh, they're toting the ark, they're toting the ark. Uh, mainly what are they doing? Uh, walking. A lot of marching, a lot of marching, a lot of marching, a lot of marching, a lot of marching. How do we want to march? Let's go counterclockwise for, Na- clockwise for the NASCAR fans, right? Left-hand turns, marching. What is marching? It's taking one step that God has placed in front of you at a time. But for a long time, nothing seemed to happen. It was persistence, it was patience, it was perseverance, it was time. Young guns, my people in their 20s, younger. I love young leaders. At Glades and First Baptist, I release young people into leaders. I got more leaders with pimples at my church. (laughs) Ride their long boards to work. I love young, it's biblical. There's great young leaders. Daniel's a young leader, but guess what though I, I release young leaders, I believe in the power of process. Joshua is the new leader, but he took the time to be mentored. He joyfully participates in a prolonged apprenticeship. Listen, he took the time. We meet him in Exodus chapter 17. In Exodus chapter uh, uh, 34, we find out he's Moses' aide, Moses' aide. Nick, what does that even mean? Moses' aide, does it mean he's, he's helping Moses with important stuff like writing sermons or mapping out battle strategies? Or was he getting Moses coffee? or packing Moses' bag as the the pillar of fire moved, or what it says a lot of the time he spent in the Bible was waiting. He'd wait outside the tent while Moses talked with God day after day. He'd wait at the foot of Mount Zion with Moses for 40 days in the minute. He'd just wait, he'd just wait, he'd just wait, and he'd learn and get better. So if you're young, listen, and you feel like it's not happening as fast as you want, if you're a Z or a millennial, like, when's it gonna happen? When's the spotlight gonna find me? When will I be verified? When, listen, listen, your 20s are time for you to struggle a little bit and to learn and to grow and falter. So if the spotlight has not found you yet, God's given you precious time to get better. To get better, listen, to grow. Think about biblically. What did Jesus do in his 20s? What's the Bible say? There's not a verse. Was he just messing around at South Beach? What was he doing? We don't know. So Jesus at 20, uh, if he did a miracle, if he turned the water into wine, he wasn't old enough to drink any. He's 20. He was a carpenter. Age 25, carpenter. Age 29, better carpenter. But don't you know God used his 20s? God the Father is pouring everything into God the Son that he would need someday when his ministry went public at age 30. That it'd be the most earth changing, world shattering, gosh, heaven populating, hell plundering mission of all time. And it's not just Jesus. Uh, Saul becomes the first king of Israel, age 30. David becomes the first, best king of Israel, age 30. Uh, Ezekiel's called in the prophetic ministry, age 30. Um, Levit- Leviticus, priests could not enter the priesthood until age 30. Didn't matter how talented you were. So guess what? If you're a young person, I'm not saying be lazy or be soft or be sinful, but grow, grind, get better, get ready. Right now, listen, uh, scientists say your, your mind's not fully formed. It says your neurological pathways are so solidified. It means this, young people, you're wet concrete. 
Nothing wrong with that. Wet concrete's awesome. If there's an impurity or contamination or flaw in wet concrete, it's easy to smooth it out, to get the character just the way it needs to be. But for people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond, we're dry concrete. And the Holy Spirit has to take a jackhammer, right, <laughs> to work on our character. So grow, get better, it's fine, take your time. By the way, older people, are you enjoy this too much? What were you like in your 20s? You were a hot mess in your 20s. You were a thinner hot mess, but you were a hot mess, right? Right, you're a dumpster fire with a better metabolism. So we're not judging anybody, but use this time to get ready. Success takes time, so who is mentoring you? Paul had Barnabas, Timothy had Paul, Elijah had Elijah, uh, gosh, Spider-Man had Tony Stark. Luke Skywalker had Yoda. Harry had Dumbledore. I keep going. Adonis had Rocky. Find someone older, wiser, who loves you and love God and pour into them and let them pour into you. Amen? Take the time to get better quickly. I wrote this down. Be wise enough not to compare. Wise enough not to compare. Nothing will assassinate your contentment more than comparison. Let me show you in the Word of God. I'm gonna go New Testament right now. Something the Apostle Paul wrote that I think is so insightful when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. We, however, do not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the field God has assigned. One more time, God has assigned to us, assigned to us. When I say three, shout the word assignment. One, two, three. Here's why it's stupid to compare. And listen, I live in Parkland. We do that here. Oh, their neighborhood. They're a member of the club. Do you see his car? Their kids so accomplished, star athlete, scholar. My kid's on the bench. TG, I know I'm preaching good when they laugh or when they clap or they stare at me like they're doing right now. <laughs> it will sabotage your commitment, a contentment. It puts pressure on the people you love. Paul says you want to compare yourself? Compare yourself to the you who needs to accomplish the assignment God's given you. Look, we have this monolithic, one-dimensional view of blessing in America. Blessings always, uh, if you're blessed, you, you have the answer prayer. If you're blessed, you're comfortable. If you're blessed, you're affluent. If you're blessed, you're succeeding. But really? I, I did a deep dive on Hagar. Hagar. Y'all remember Hagar? Hagar. Uh, who is Hagar? She's, uh, she's Abraham's side chick. Can I be that graphic? She's the other woman. You remember that weird story where you know, God promised Abraham and Sarah they become parents, they're already senior adults, biologically impossible. She's postmenopausal. And, and so it takes 25 years for them to give birth to Isaac. Remember Isaac, Isaac, I say three, shout the name Isaac. One, two, three, Isaac, child of promise, father of the Hebrew people. But along the way, uh, Sarah gets impatient and has a little lack of faith, and she offers up to her husband, Abraham, Hagar, her servant, as a sexual surrogate. And you're like, that is creepy, and you're not wrong. That's what the culture did back in the day. And Hagar does get pregnant, gives birth to Ishmael. When I say three, shout the name Ishmael. One, two, three, Ishmael. Ishmael becomes the father of the Arab people. Think about the conflict we have in the world today. It all goes back to a bad decision made by Abraham and Sarah. I wish I had time to unpack that. But the villain here, the bad guy, is not Ishmael or Hagar. They are victims. They are marginalized people. So finally, when Sarah does get pregnant with Isaac, and Isaac is born and he's weaned, she gets jealous of Hagar and says, Abraham, get rid of her and her child. And my brother's father Abraham, the hero of faith, in a spineless moment, sends them away. And they're dying of dehydration in Genesis chapter 21. And poor Hagar can't watch her little boy die. So she puts him under a bush in the shade and goes a little further away and she's just weeping and crying. But God, but God hears her cry and comes there and says, guess what? I'm gonna save you and save your boy. And more than that, I'm gonna bless your boy. And look at the language in Genesis 21, verse 20. I've highlighted two words on the screen ready right now. It says, God was with God. One more time. God was with the boy Ishmael as he grew up and lived in the desert. Stop. When you see a word like this in this context, with means blessed or favored. So God was with Isaac, child of promise. But he's also with Ishmael. But it looks different. Isaac grows up how? Two parents adore him. They're loaded. They're famous. They're powerful. He has beautiful clothes, lives in a great tent. He's adored, has the best food. Ishmael, God's with him too, lives in the desert. It's rough, it's rugged. A strong single mom, not two parents, but she's awesome. Says he becomes an archer. an archer. See, they had different assignments. 
Isaac had one assignment, but Ishmael's is very different. His life is going to be tough, so God had grew up the muscle and the resolve and the problem. So I love he's an arch, archer. I love that detail. Think when you think of Ishmael, think Green Arrow. Think Hawkeye, Robin Hood, Katniss from Hunger Games, right? right? That's, that's B.A. right there. That's amazing. I love, I love that description of who he is. He's self-reliant because he's blessed. Don't look at other people and be jealous. Must be nice. That neighborhood, that car, oh, their, their marriage, their parents. Who knows what happens behind the scene? You focus on God getting you ready for your assignment. Archer. I like that because you know, as Ishmael grew up, his boys razzed him. Hey, look at your brother. Look at your half brother, man. He's rich. He has luxurious clothes. He's a mate. He has servants and staff. You have staff. You're, you're rich, right? He has people make him breakfast in bed. Ishmael, you don't get that. And Ishmael would say, I don't need that. I'm an archer. I can get my own food, my own breakfast, and feed my mama as well. Amen? Amen? Amen. Don't be jealous. And then quickly and finally, um, Joshua took the time to be with God. Why? Because this plan's weird. This, this plan, I know you grew up in you know, vacation Bible school singing, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. But if you're new to the story, if you're new hearing this for the first or second time, you're like, yes, this is, this is ludicrous. This is unorthodox. This is counterintuitive. I mean, who, who takes down the city by just marching in circles in silence? Then they toot horns and shout. I mean, who? Yeah, it's weird. It's weird. It's weird. This is not formative. This is not a template for the future. This, this plan to take down a walled city has worked one time in the history of warfare. They don't teach this at West Point to the cadets. Uh, this is not a model for us in the future. You know, Christian, you do your Jericho walk around the, uh, around the Cadillac dealership, right? I'm gonna march around seven times, and on the seventh day, I'm gonna shout, and the dealer's gonna come out and give me the keys to my Escalade. Not gonna work. Worked one time. But Joshua got the plan in chapter five from God himself. Maybe Jesus, I wish I had time. It's called the captain of the host, the armies of the living Lord. He got the plan from God. So here's what I love. Again, don't, don't spiritualize, sanitize these stories. Joshua's the new guy. He's following Moses. He's talking about comparison. He's following Moses, one of the greatest leaders in human history. And this is his first military campaign. So I, I like to think about, like to think about, you know, Joshua, maybe, maybe, um, Rolling into the tent of meeting that night. There's, there's a large tent, maybe in Ephraim, that's his home tribe. And all the captains are in the tent, all his commanders. They're older and more experienced than he is. He's new. Uh, the tent uh, guards outside, armed guards, maybe torches inside. There's this smoke in the room and an eerie light, probably a large table. The detailed map of Jericho, why provided by the spies, the Rahab hid. So they're all waiting for him and they're, they're talking before he arrives like, what is General Joshua gonna come up with? Maybe it's, it's gonna be a siege. Maybe he commands us to build catapults and battering rams. Maybe a frontal assault on the, the walls and the gates. What's he gonna choose? And Joshua, walks in that room and says, gentlemen, for seven days, we march in circles. That's how God told me we win. And listen, listen, guys, they do it. They follow him. Why, why, why? He had the resolve that only comes with someone who's been in the presence of the living Lord. He had that, that unswavering, he had that confidence, that, that look in his eye, I've been with God and my God told me this is the plan we have. And when God gives you a plan for your family or for your marriage or for your business or for your finances or for your pride, God always succeeds. You go with God. In fact, I, I got a theory, TJ, the reason they had to march in silence was so they didn't trash talk Joshua. Right? After three or four days, there's people going, he has lost his mind. This makes no sense. Moses never did this before, right? Oh my gosh, they're laughing at us up there. So has God given you a plan? You've not yet seen the payoff or the blessing? Just, just keep marching. One more step, one more step, one more step. In fact, there's somebody in this room right now, you're so discouraged, you're so frustrated, you think, did I even hear from God back then? Was I, I know there's a verse. I know the pastor said it and it resonated in my heart, but I, did I even hear, I'm, I'm so discouraged, I'm I'm just ready to quit. Oh my gosh. God brought me to this church. I come and speak here once every two years, maybe. And God's aligned this divine collision between what I'm gonna say right now and just your reality. Don't you dare quit. Unless God told you to quit. 
My guess is you're not seeing anything right now. This, this is not an incremental miracle. An incremental meaning mean like, that'd be like if they, they marched around one day, seven days, right? Seven days. They marched down one day, the first day, uh, one seventh of the wall would come down. Like, oh, look, one seventh. And day two, another seventh. And day three, then the seventh day, they just kind of step over all the rubble. But for six days and the better part of the seventh day, nothing seemed to happen. But every lap on every day, every corner turn, every step was part of the miracle. There's somebody here, listen, you're just on day six. And you're discouraged because you're not seeing any breakthrough yet. You're on day six. Or you're on day seven. And it's just lap four. You're day seven. You're getting so tired. You're feeling foolish. It's just lap five. You're day seven on lap six, but you don't know it. And you're thinking about tapping out, taking a knee, surrendering, standing down. Don't you quit. You are so close to your miracle. You're so close to your breakthrough. Don't you quit. Don't you quit. In Jesus' name, don't you quit. It is almost time for the people of God to shout. And after we shout in unity, the walls come tumbling down. Don't you quit. Don't you quit. Don't you quit. Say it with me. Don't you quit. Don't you quit until God tells you to quit. If he didn't tell you to quit, it's not time to quit. It's almost time to shout. Amen? Almost time to shout. You're on the edge of your miracle. You're in the beginning of your breakthrough. I know nothing seems to be happening, but heaven is moving on your behalf. The angels are aligning right now. The demons are trembling right now. Don't you quit. Don't you quit. Make that move. Or someone right now who's never, ever given their life to Christ, now is the time. And today is your day. Now I'll lead you in a simple salvation prayer. Just take these words. They're not magic words. My words don't matter. God's weighing the sincerity of your heart. I want everyone to bow their heads, close their eyes. If you want to be saved, the Bible says for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Pray this, pray, uh, okay, Jesus, I'm in. I I want it. Yeah, I didn't think this was my day, but evidently this is my day. I'm seizing my moment. I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sin. I believe you arose again, and I believe you're alive right now. Come into my life and save me. Forgive me. I want all of it. I want heaven. I want freedom. I want forgiveness. I want your acceptance. I want it all, and I'll receive it all because I make this prayer, this salvation prayer right now in Jesus' name. Amen.